tonight's discussion is the way of the reformer is hard. Gough Whitlam's activist government, its obstruction and dismissal. Lessons for today. And we are very honored and have a great pleasure to have Emeritus Professor Jenny Hocking with us tonight. She's former Australian Prime Minister Gough Whitlam's most prestigious biographer and she is the inaugural Distinguished Whitlam Fellow with the Whitlam Institute in West Sydney University. So I think she's probably Australia's most uh, advanced biographer on Gough Whitlam. So we can ask her all the questions we might like at the end. Um, she's also a political scientist and Emeritus Professor of Monash University and former director of the National Center for Australian Studies at Monash University. Her work is in two key areas, counter-terrorism and Australian political biography. Her research into the life of Gough Whitlam uncovered significant new material on the role of the High Court Justice, Sir Anthony Mason, in the dismissal of the Whitlam government. And this has been described as a, a discovery of historical importance. So I hope you'll ask her lots of questions about that tonight. What were those discoveries? What were those secrets? So Gough Whitlam's Prime Ministership gives us an opportunity to reflect on what happens when an entrenched establishment is confronted with a radical change agenda. Prior to Whitlam, Australia was locked into a very conservative political culture. And then Whitlam came along with the most progressive change agenda in Australian political history, probably to date. Many of those changes are still with us and to the distaste of the establishment with us, they know that there'd be a public revolt if they actually tried to change some of the major advancements Gough made. He addressed Australia's forgotten populations of women. He gave them a right to divorce without question, which must have been an amazing freedom. He supported indigenous people in a new way, giving the first land rights to um, a group in the north. And he pursued his passion with determination and zeal, and his whirlwind reform program took 90 short days to implement, but it left the establishment shaken to its core. So Jenny Hocking has done a remarkable job in speaking and in seeking to uncover the truth of what occurred from, I think, 1972 to 75, if I'm not corrected, and the entirety of that truth still remains hidden today. So we can learn much about the machinations of power in Australia and the challenges faced by any progressive leader seeking to upend elite rule, as many of us here tonight might like. So as we approach this crucial federal election that will determine the future direction, uh, that Australia takes. What lessons can we draw from that Whitlam era? Could a 90-day legislative blitz work now? Should we act this rapidly? Does the crisis we face demand such? What are the possible consequences of a Whitlam-like approach? And is it likely to happen? So these are some of the questions. So tonight, the Nagara Institute is delighted to welcome Jenny Hocking to the stage with a warm Malambimbi round of applause. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Bundjalung Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and future. Thanks to Richard Hill and the Nagara Institute for inviting me to speak tonight. It's a great thrill to be here. I'm a frequent visitor in Byron Bay and this area and uh, it's delightful to see people out tonight despite the rain. So thank you all very much for coming. I'm going to talk about obviously the Whitlam government today, possible lessons for reform, and also of course the mystery really of the dismissal of the Whitlam government and what we're still uncovering to this day, which I've found uh, a compelling part of my work, otherwise I wouldn't still be doing it after 10, 15 years. 
Um, and we're still not over that point of uh, so much information being withheld from us, which is really quite remarkable. I do want to talk about that. And I welcome and encourage questions at the end, and you may well want to raise things that I haven't spoken about today, but which um, you'd like to perhaps put in a more contemporary context. And that would lead to, I think, a very interesting discussion. As Pradham has said, I've spent many years working on Gough Whitlam's life and writing about Gough Whitlam. I love writing biography. It's a fascinating form for a, a whole host of reasons. It's a creative form, but it's always, for me, based in solid research. Um, I wrote a, a two-volume biography of Gough Whitlam, which took the best part of seven years after beginning it, thinking it would be one volume over in three years. But I have to say, Gough Whitlam himself was extremely pleased to see a two-volume biography, because there are only, only four, four Prime Ministers now who have such a two-volume biography. And um, in fact, when I took him the second volume, he looked at me rather hopefully and said, only two. <laughs> And so since then I began what you know you might consider a very slim third volume of the Whitlam biography and that is a book which I actually have uh, a select number for sale here, about 12 of them, uh, which is the dismissal dossier. Everything you were never meant to know about November 1975. Uh, and it's a great way of pulling together everything I've uncovered about the dismissal, all of the errors, all of the omissions, and really putting it in one place and saying, this is what I think you need to know if you want to understand what really happened. It's had two updates since, and the most recent is called The Palace Connection. So you can probably understand what that is all about. Yeah. I'll talk a little bit about that later. When I first began work on Whitlam's biography, it really surprised me to realise that although so much had been written about him, although he was such a well-known person, we really knew very little about Whitlam himself. His childhood, his parents, his political influences, university life, his war service in the Second World War his political trajectory through the Labour Party, the decades in opposition, his life after politics, which was really rich and fascinating, his family life with Margaret. What it was that made Gough Whitlam the great reformer that we now understand him to have been. And it's particularly fitting as we meet under the auspices of the Nagara Institute today to know that Nagara was the name of Gough Whitlam's birthplace. That was the name of his grandparents' house in Kew in Melbourne, where he was born. And not only was it his grandfather's house, not only was it where Whitlam was born, but his grandfather had actually built the house. Now, Nagara, that is not the institute, but Whitlam's birthplace, was demolished a couple of years ago, only a couple of years ago. And I was part of a series of submissions from, largely from architects, but also from me, you urging Heritage Victoria to protect Nagara as a significant part of our political heritage. But we didn't succeed and the developers went in and Nagara has been lost to us. He lived in the house until he was about three. And it's also an interesting fact about Gough Whitlam's grandfather, which I didn't know and which I can assure you Gough Whitlam didn't know, was that his grandfather had, had been a youthful criminal which I uncovered in the files of the Victorian Public Records Office, much to my shock. Henry Hugh Gough Whitlam, that was his name, had been a prisoner in Pentridge from the age of 19, serving four and a half years with hard labour for forging two cheques. And it was actually quite a sad, poignant family story of um, a father running away and leaving five children and a wife destitute, but I don't have time to go into it. However, it's in the book. Um, you can understand my apprehension then when I had to go to Sydney and make a special trip to tell Gough Whitlam this unfortunate news about the grandfather he knew and loved and whose name he shared. So it was one of our most fascinating conversations which followed. And about a week later I had a call in my office from his uh, PA saying Mr Whitlam would like to speak to you and making a date where he and his sister Frieda Whitlam both of them by then in their late 80s, together wanted to talk to me about what I'd found and this great shock they had and uh, some distress. I mean, they were proud as they called him grandfather the felon from that moment on. But, but what really concerned them was, did their own father know and hadn't told them? 
that, <laughs> for me, that was a really interesting insight into a very personal aspect of biography. When you find something that really deeply affects the person, the subject, um, that you then have to tell them and perhaps changes the way they understood their own family. And I couldn't answer it. I didn't know if his father knew and had kept it from them. I doubt it. But it, it obviously concerned them greatly to know that. Whitlam was elected the member for Werra in 1952. He worked his way through the Labor Party through those terrible barren years when the party was basically unelectable following the split in the 1950s and 1960s to become deputy leader in 1960, leader in 1967 and then Labor Prime Minister on the 2nd of December 1972. The Whitlam government was then re-elected in the double dissolution election of May 1974, an election that's often forgotten. And on the 11th of November 1975, Gough Whitlam and his entire government was famously dismissed from office without warning by the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, in an unprecedented use of the Governor-General's claimed reserve powers. Kerr's actions in removing an elected government which retained its parliamentary majority and the confidence of the House of Representatives at all times remains one of the most contentious and divisive episodes in our political history. In place of the Whitlam government, which had been re-elected just 18 months earlier in the 74 election, Kerr appointed as Prime Minister the Liberal Party leader, Malcolm Fraser, <coughs> whose party had lost the previous two elections and who did not have the confidence of the House of Representatives. Kerr's actions ended the term of what is undoubtedly the most reforming government ever in our history, which in that relatively short time of three years introduced a remarkable range of reforms. These reforms, in Whitlam's words, remain like all great Labor tradition and all great Labor legislation, permanent landmarks in our history. Let's just have a quick look at only some, only a few, of those permanent landmarks in our history. I couldn't possibly go through them all, there were over 200. Abolition of the death penalty, equal pay for women, the appointment of Justice Elizabeth Everett as Deputy President of the Conciliation and Arbitration Commission and later the first Chief Justice of the Family Court. The Family Law Act and no-fault divorce. Needs-based funding for schools and a four-fold increase in education funding. Free tertiary education. Increased funding for the arts. Childcare, school dental care, single mother's benefit. Electoral reform with one vote, one value, that is equal electorates. Before that time, we had suffered the most appalling gerrymander in the rural areas where the country party would get four or five seats per one Labor city seat. Votes for 18-year-olds. Until then, the voting age was 21, and that was really important for something I will talk about shortly. The release of draft resistors from prison. Senate representation for the Northern Territory and the ACT. It's remarkable that until the Whitlam government, not, neither the Australian Capital Territory nor the Northern Territory had any Senate representation. They had no presence in the Senate in our federal parliament. The introduction of the Australian Honour System. The end of God Save the Queen is our national anthem. <laughs> An introduction of an Australian national anthem. Foreign ownership restrictions for mining and energy companies. Some things remain the same. <laughs> national legal aid system, the Law Reform Commission, the Office of the Status of Women, the introduction of Aboriginal land rights for the, Gurin for the Gurindji at Dagaragu, and the introduction of the first Northern Territory Land Rights Bill rejected, of course, by the Fraser-led opposition. The end of the white Australia policy, multiculturalism as a policy of government, and the really important Racial Discrimination Act. Really important because without that act, Mabo No. 1, the first of the Mabo cases in Queensland, would not have succeeded. And the Mabo case, as we know it, with its great significance, would not have been possible. The universal health insurance scheme that we all know and love then called Medivac, now of course Medicare. An independent foreign policy stance and taking France to the International Court of Justice over nuclear testing in the Pacific and joining with New Zealand in that successful application to force the French to take its nuclear testing in the Pacific under the sea rather than above ground, although they wanted it to cease altogether. Now, many of those remarkable reforms were put in place during the equally unprecedented period that followed the election, two-week period called the Duumvirate. Yeah. 
and it was called that because it was made up of two people, Gough Whitlam and his deputy Lance Barnard. Between them, they took all 27 ministerial portfolios. Gough always said, well, I very generously gave Lance 13, 14 and I took 13. <laughs> and between them, it meant that the reform process before Parliament reconvened and while they were still counting seats and the Christmas period looming, it meant the process of reform for things that did not require legislative approval could start at once. So it was a really important statement. We are about reform, we're going to get it done, and we're serious. So between them, they began that process within two days of the election of the Whitlam government. And the very first decision they made was to release all young men who were in prison for refusing to fight in that immensely unpopular Vietnam War, releasing them from prison. Now, the point about that and why it relates to the lowering of the voting age is that these men were as young as 20 and they couldn't yet vote because the vote was for 21 year olds and yet they'd been in prison for refusing to go to a war that they couldn't vote about. Their release, as I said, was the first action of the Whitlam government. It was followed by the government then ending conscription in peacetime, and it soon also withdrew the remaining service people that were still in Vietnam. But that duumvirate period was a fascinating and historic uh, moment in our history, a two-week period of just unrelenting reform that went through. The papers at the time, it's really interesting to look back at them, were running headings saying things like, what the government did today, day one, day two, day three, and you know, there'd be a list of five or six things that were done. And there was a real sense of change, of, of great activity that was very compelling and hard to avoid. Just some of them again. The government supported UN sanctions over apartheid in South Africa and Rhodesia before the UN, recognised the People's Republic of China, closed the Rhodesian Embassy in Sydney, appointed an interim schools commission, banned racially based sporting tours, announced that they would have a Royal Commission into land rights in the Northern Territory, abolished race as a criterion of immigration policy, which effectively was the end of the white Australia policy finally, reopened the equal pay case in the Conciliation and Arbitration Commission which the previous McMahon government had made a submission against equal pay for women. Whitlam called it to reopen, put forward a submission in support of equal pay and briefed the young Sydney barrister Mary Gordon to take the case for the government. And Mary Gordon, of course, was later the first woman appointed to the High Court, many years later. The full extent of the Whitlam government's reform package, the program as they called it, was set out in that marvellous 1972 policy speech the famous It's Time policy speech. And there are, as I said, over 200 individual points of policy development. In implementing this quite extraordinary agenda, Whitlam faced unprecedented obstruction from so many quarters, not only inside the parliament, and they were really significant through the Senate in particular, but also outside the parliament. But I think it's really important to remember, so we don't get too despondent, that despite those immense difficulties, how much of that ambitious reform program was actually put in place. In Whitlam's estimation, around two thirds of those reforms were implemented. And so quite clearly, as Whitlam himself recognised, there are really significant lessons for achieving reform to be learned from the experiences of his activist government, particularly in terms of overcoming immense obstacles to reform and delivering a reform agenda. I just want to make some revealing, I think, preliminary remarks about Whitlam and his approach to politics before we take that further. Firstly, and I think this is fundamental to understanding both Whitlam as a person and also what we now call Whitlamism, his approach to politics. His priority was always to gain office, to form government. In Whitlam's view, there could no, be no reform you could achieve no reform without first achieving electoral success and forming government. So in this, he was a realist, he was a pragmatist. He wasn't an extra parliamentary or protest movement idealist. And I think that's often misunderstood. For this, he was deeply resented within the party, even hated by the Labor Party's hard left faction, particularly in Victoria, which was widely seen as an unelectable basket case, not my words, and which had the lowest Labor Party vote of all states in the late 60s and was clearly a barrier to the Labor Party achieving government. There were deep divisions in the party over Labor policy, over the Vietnam War, the white Australia policy and funding for non-government schools in particular. 
But Whitlam had no time for this, what he called ideological purity, which he described as a philosophy of failure. He understood that political vision without political power is the prerogative of protest groups, he said, not of a party wanting to govern. So he never held back from this view in his own party. And, and you know, there are a lot of divisions, and, uh, and I think ones that we tend to skate over today. In an absolutely ferocious speech, which is a wonderful speech to read, uh, but it probably was not a wonderful speech to hear, <laughs> to the Victorian State Conference in 1967, Whitlam excoriated the left for damaging Labor's chance of victory by insisting on unelectable and unwinnable policy positions. He told them, you find in defeat a form of justification and a proof of the purity of your principles. And then he said, certainly the impotent are pure. <laughs> in other words, he said, without government, there can be no reform. You could be pure and you would be impotent powerless and unable to achieve any reform at all. And it's that constant tension between government and principle and then reform that you see played out, I think, in reforming governments all the time. And two years later, Whitlam drove federal intervention into the Victorian branch of the Labor Party and cleaned out that hard left to lasting and bitter enmities. And I interviewed people, you know, four decades later who were just driven by this <laughs> seething hatred for Gough Whitlam over Victorian intervention. And it took me so long to get my head around this, this division. But it was the harbinger of electoral success. If he had not done that, he would never have achieved electoral success and we would never have had the Whitlam government and those extraordinary reforms. Secondly, Whitlam was an institutionalist. He was no radical on that scale. He was a great believer in parliamentary democracy, in the party system, in the post-war international order which had formed around the United Nations. And he was also a great believer in what he called the Great Australian Labor Party, the first Labor Party in the world. So anyone who imagines that Whitlam might have been, as I've heard it put around more recently, that he might have been a Greens Party member or even a supporter today, well, no, <laughs> absolutely no. This suggestion fails to understand the fundamental true believer in Gough Whitlam and his commitment to the Labor Party. It was lifelong. And he said to me once, anyone who understands my, my family couldn't fail but understand why I'm a Labor Party man. That was just intrin intrinsic to him. Disagreeing with Labor policy or falling out with its leaders as he did from time to time would never have induced him to walk away from the Labor Party. Whitlam always said that he took an uncomplicated approach to, Labor Party, to the Labor Party platform and its policies. Where I disagreed with it, he said, I sought to change it. Where I agreed with it, I sought to implement it. So he didn't shy away from policies he disagreed with, and in the early years in particular, there were many of it. He spent 10 years working to change the old-style Labor Party policies from the 40s and 50s. And finally, Whitlam recognised that politics is a process. It's dynamic. It's about change and managing change and about maintaining core political values while adapting how you might achieve them to suit different times and to recognise different possibilities. He summed this up in two words, contemporary relevance. He said, the overarching principle and a unifying theme to all my work can be stated in those two words, contemporary relevance. Which is another way of saying, I think, that politics is always the art of the possible. And that's certainly a key part of success or reform. Knowing when to act, when to take a political risk, and when to show leadership. I give you just three examples, but there are many, many. Um, and Vic, well, maybe it's four, because the Victorian intervention, I think, was one. It was a brave, it was a brave act in a sense that was deeply divisive within his own party, but it was a masterstroke, and it had to be done, and it really effectively ensured government. But there are three others. Many of you will recall that before he took office in 1971, while the leader of the Labor Party, no official capacity, he took a Labor Party delegation to Communist China. Now at the time when the Cold War was not yet over, China was still a moment of deep division in, in the Australian community and I, I, I think in foreign policy it was ramped up by the Conservatives. His, a fear of communism was still rife 
and America, of course, had not yet recognised communist China, but it had always been Labor Party policy since the 50s. It was just something that was never really talked about. But Whitlam was up front. He would recognise communist China. So he went there with a Labor Party delegation to house, absolute house of criticism from the government and from the press here in Australia. But it was, a, again, an absolute masterstroke. It put Whitlam on the international stage because he was followed by international media throughout that whole visit. He had a meeting with Joe and Lai, which made the French newspapers and was covered extensively. And to his absolute, you, you might say, is this luck or is he aware of how the world was changing at that time? As he went back through Beijing to fly back to Sydney, unknown to him, Henry Kissinger was going into Beijing to meet Zhou Enlai and to organise the American recognition of communist China. So when you see the film Nixon and Nixon and China, actually it should have been Whitlam and China because he was there first. <laughs> so he returned to Australia now an international figure. He was way ahead of the, of the government, the Liberal Country Party government on foreign affairs and it really made a statesman of Gough Whitlam. It was brilliant timing, but it was extraordinarily risky. There were some who went with him, including Graham Freudenberg, who pleaded with him not to go. They feared that he would lose the election next year by making such an outrageous statement of support. The second thing that I see is a master stroke of leadership and recognising where you take your moment and grasp the possibility to reform was the due it. Only Gough Whitlam, with his extraordinary knowledge of the Constitution, would have known that here was a possibility, certainly caught Billy McMahon off, off guard, he thought he was going to continue as Prime Minister until Christmas. Instead, <laughs> Gough went to see the Governor-General, Sir Paul Hasluck, and had himself and, and, and Barnard sworn in as Ministers. It allowed effective reform to begin immediately, and as I said, it sent a message that they were serious about maintaining their party program. The third one, all important one, which I find so fascinating and so extraordinary for the fact that it's so, so in, infrequently remembered, is the 1974 double dissolution and the joint sitting that followed. It's my favourite section of the Constitution, the section that deals with the joint sitting and the double dissolution, because it's a wonderful, creative means of dealing with divisions between the two houses, where the Senate has blocked repeatedly government bills twice, I think, in a three-month period, then the government can bank them up, can call a double dissolution, and if it's successful, can then call a joint sitting and put those bills to a joint sitting of the House and the Senate sitting as one. Whitlam is the only Prime Minister who has ever succeeded in having both those things, not just the double dissolution, but the joint sitting. And at the joint sitting, some of the most important parts of the Whitlam government's reform package were passed. Medicare was passed at the joint sitting. One vote, one value was passed at the joint sitting. And the Territory Senate Representation Bill was passed at the joint sitting. These were really important, fundamental Whitlam reforms, and they were done through that fabulous mechanism of a joint sitting. Um, so in both those examples, the Duumvirate and the 74 double dissolution, Whitlam used the possibilities of our constitution to effect significant reform. So Parliament blocked him in so many ways, and yet he found other ways to achieve reform. And he also achieved reform through the Parliament. Let's not misunderstand that. And it was precisely because of the Whitlam government's record in successful reform, he believes, that made him a target for virulent obstruction. He later said, my government was opposed with such virulence and unscrupulousness, not because we were poor economic managers, as was claimed by the Conservatives, but because we were good and determined reformers. So although the level of parliamentary obstruction par faced by the Whitlam government had simply never been seen before, I want to give you some figures on the fate of a range of government legislation that will tell, I think, a slightly different and really interesting story. Yes, there was unprecedented obstruction and rejection in the Senate, but there was also a really extraordinary level of achievement of the passage of bills. In the years of the Whitlam government, 1973 to 75, because the Parliament didn't sit till 73, the Senate rejected 93 bills. In the previous entire 71 years since Federation, the Senate had only rejected a total of 68 government bills. So 
In that three year period, more bills, 50% more bills, were rejected in that three year period of the Whitlam government than in the entire previous 71 years of our parliamentary history. It's extraordinary. The extent of the of, of obstruction through the Senate was extraordinary. But also during the Whitlam government, 1973 to 5, 507 government bills were passed into law, and that was also a record. So you have this interesting figure where a record number of bills was rejected by, a Senate, by the Senate, a record number of bills was introduced by the government, and a record number of bills was actually passed under the Whitlam government. So around two thirds, according to Whitlam, of his reform agenda was actually successful. In my view, and we mentioned this earlier in the introduction, the single greatest obstacle Whitlam faced as a reforming Prime Minister was the simple fact that he came to office after 23 years of Conservative rule. The Liberal Country Party Coalition, which is always imbued with a sense of entitlement, we know, but it was a particularly entrenched sense of entitlement after 23 years. They could not and would not accept defeat. The expectation of Liberal Country Party government had become entrenched not only in the coalition parties, but also in the bureaucracy and in the public service. And that was immensely damaging. That period of unbroken conservative rule, whatever party is in office, I think is very unhealthy for, for any polity. And it was immensely damaging for relations between senior public servants and the Whitlam government. From the very outset, the new opposition coalition, which could scarcely recognise itself on the opposition benches, simply refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the Whitlam government. Now, you can see this most clearly in comments by the Liberal Senator Reg Withers, the ruthless opposition leader in the Senate known as Toe Cutter. Just weeks after Whitlam's election victory, Withers dismissed the election outcome as a result of the temporary political insanity of the electorate. <laughs> and Withers promised that the opposition would use their numbers in the Senate to bring down the Whitlam government. He, he made that speech to Parliament in March 1973, just months after the election of the Whitlam government. And of course, it's exactly what they did. Now, although 43 years have passed since the dismissal, it's absolutely staggering that we still don't know the full story of just what happened on the 11th of November 1975 when Kerr sacked Whitlam, because so much of the relevant material remains closed to us. But we do know a great deal more about the dismissal today than we did even 10 years ago. And I have to say, we do know a lot more about the dismissal in large part because I uncovered a lot of it when I was looking into particular Sir John Kerr's papers, but other papers, for when I, did, when I was working on Whitlam's biography. And one thing is abundantly clear, and that is that the dismissal was marked by secrecy, collusion and deception on a previously unimagined scale. Deception of the Prime Minister Gough Whitlam by all of the key participants, Kerr, Fraser, High Court Justices, and we now know the palace. And it's because of that really remarkable level of secrecy at the heart of the dismissal that the history of it has changed quite dramatically in recent years. Because eventually, secrets come out, and especially political secrets. So what we thought happened, what we were told happened at the time and in the years following is vastly different from what we know today. Let me just recap those key points and what happened on that day and before for those who either can't recall, weren't there, or maybe aren't quite as obsessed as I have been for the last 10 years. Whitlam had arrived at Government House Share Alumna at 1 p.m. on the 11th of November 1975 for a pre-arranged meeting with Sir John Kerr to finalise the half Senate election, which was due at that time, and which Whitlam was going to announce in the House of Representatives that afternoon. That was the end of the so-called supply crisis, the half Senate election. For the previous four weeks, as you'd know, the opposition senators had refused to vote on the government supply bills. They hadn't voted against it, they just refused to vote on it. They were trying to force Whitlam to an election, another election. In the new political vernacular, supply was blocked. Calling the House Senate election had always been Whitlam's response to it. The caucus had unanimously supported that as the end point if the coalition could continue to oppose the passage of supply. 
Whitlam would call the half cent election at a time of his choosing, which was nothing more or less than the Prime Minister's regular prerogative. The Prime Minister chooses the timing of an election. There's a 12-month period set in the Constitution within which a half cent election has to be held. It was constitutionally required that he hold it either then or the previous June or sometime before the next July. The key point to make here is that the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, was fully aware that the half Senate election was to be the end point for the stalemate over supply. And Kerr also knew that Whitlam was going to announce it in the Senate on the 11th of November that afternoon in the House. Now, he knew it because Whitlam had told him that five days earlier. And over the weekend, they had exchanged between their officers the necessary paperwork. There's no secret about that. All that material is now in the archives and I located it there. In fact, the wording, the date of the election had been agreed, 13th of December, and the wording of the announcement had been with, confirmed with Kerr by Whitlam just that morning by telephone, the morning of the 11th of November. Now, Whitlam arrived at Yarralumla, he thought, to sign off on those agreed arrangements for the half Senate election, and he was instead dismissed without warning. And this is why Whitlam always described the dismissal as an ambush. And as I said, in Whitlam's place, Kerr appointed Fraser, leader of the opposition, without a majority in the House of Representatives. In fact, within two hours of Whitlam's dismissal, the afternoon of the, of the 11th of November, and this is also often forgotten in the history, the House of Representatives continued to sit. We often remember that the Senate continued to sit, but so did the House. And I don't usually recommend that you have a look at Hansard, but Hansard for that afternoon is absolutely enthralling because two governments hung in the balance the appointed government of Malcolm Fraser and the elected government of Gough Whitlam. And the noise and the inability of the parliamentary Hansard taker, note taker, to actually record that. And every now and then there's raw, raw written in the Hansard trying to describe the noise from the public gallery. People are in really deep distress and anguish. And most of the, most of the government members don't actually know that, 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 that Fra no one knew that Fraser had already been appointed Prime Minister until he stood up at about quarter past three and said so. So, um, what, what occurred in, in, in the House is really significant and often forgotten, as I said. The House passed a motion of no confidence in the appointed Fraser government by 10 votes. And that same motion called on the Governor-General to reinstall a government led by the member for Werra, that is, Gough Whitlam. That's the most critical motion, as you would know from our recent history. A motion of confidence is the, the means through which governments are determined. Now, in what I call, in my biography and in this little book here, the second dismissal, Sir John Kerr simply refused to see the Speaker of the House bringing him the motion and refused to acknowledge the motion of no confidence in Fraser, much less that it was calling on him to reinstate the Whitlam government. Kerr kept the unelected Fraser government in office and then called an election giving Fraser both the benefit of incumbency and giving Whitlam the opprobrium of dismissal and unexpected opposition. Now in the years to follow that really dramatic day, the history of the dismissal, that is how it was written, how we analysed it, became as divided and as polarising as the dismissal itself. A dominant dismissal narrative took shape, which is sort of an official version of events, which we now know was marked by errors, omissions, and even by deliberate distortions by those involved. We were always told that the Governor-General acted alone, that he had no prior contact with Malcolm Fraser, that the Queen didn't know that this was a solo act. As Kerr said in his memoirs, I made up my mind on my own part. Or in the words of the veteran journalist Alan Reid, Kerr reached a lonely and agonising decision. <laughs> it was simple, straightforward and completely untrue. Now in recent years this long-standing view of the dismissal as Kerr's solo performance in which no one else knew or was involved has um, com has com has comprehensively unravelled. It's now clear that there was a very different history, a secret history about the dismissal to be found in archival records personal interviews, and which have gradually told a different story. 
we owe it to Reg Withers, who was by then a very disgruntled former minister in the Fraser government, and that's a very dangerous thing. A disgruntled former minister with a couple of big secrets to tell. And he revealed, about 10 years later, what had long been suspected and always publicly denied by Fraser himself and Kerr, and that is that Fraser and Kerr had been in secret communication before the dismissal and had agreed on the terms by which Kerr would dismiss Whitlam and appoint Fraser as Prime Minister. In fact, I'll speak to that later. We, we now also know that the Queen, Prince Charles and Buckingham Palace were well aware that Kerr was considering dismissing Whitlam and that the Queen had been in regular communication with Kerr in the months before the dismissal took place. These secret letters, also called the Palace Letters, are in Kerr's papers in the National Archives, but we can't see them. They're not open for public access, even for research purposes, despite their obvious historical significance. They're embargoed by the Queen till at least 2027, and after that date, her, secretary, her private secretary retains a veto over them, so it's quite possible we won't ever see them. And it's for that reason that about three years ago, I initiated a federal court action, crowdfunded, I'll give you the address, um, uh, against the National Archives seeking the release of the palace letters. I have, a, I must say and thank, a wonderful legal team all working pro bono, which has been Tom Brennan, a barrister in Sydney, Anthony Whitlam QC, uh, and most recently Brett Walker SC, uh, and instructed by Cause Chambers Westgarth in Sydney, and also want to thank the Grata Fund, which has given support for public litigation in public interest cases, and all of the people who have supported the crowdfunding campaign through Chuffed. It's called Release the Palace Letters. You can't miss it. And um, we've been enormously supported and the legal team has just been exceptional. And we're now beginning the process of a special leave application to the High Court of Australia, which we hope will give us uh, another opportunity to argue this case for the release of those letters. So just a few things because I'm going to run out of time as usual. <laughs> Kerr's papers in the National Archives have been absolutely spectacular for revising what we previously understood about the dismissal. It was there that I found what was mentioned earlier, which is the role of Sir Anthony Mason. I found Kerr's absolutely spine-tingling 12-page account of the secret, utterly unexpected role of the then High Court Justice Sir Anthony Mason, which had been kept secret from the Australian public and from our history for 37 years. I can't begin to tell you the sensation of reading this and realising that this was a really critical historical document. That revelation of Kerr's secret lengthy me meetings and discussions and planning with Mason over several months before the dismissal was even described by the Australian, not my, not usually my greatest supporter, we've had some issues, as quote, a discovery of historical importance. And they were published in 2012 in the second volume of my biography, Gough Whitlam, His Time. They confirm the worst possible aspects of the dismissal, the subterfuge, the deception that Kerr always denied, and the extraordinary breadth of other people's knowledge of his planning and intentions. In fact, Mason's role went further. The following day, he confirmed his role. It was the first time he'd ever spoken about it. And he also revealed, quite blithely, as though it didn't really matter much, that he'd drafted the letter of dismissal for Kerr. In other words, this was a really active role taken by a sitting High Court Justice, secret from the current Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, and then kept secret from us, the Australian public, for 37 years. But the discovery of that single, ch single file changed the history, the way we understood the history of the dismissal, irrevocably. So that narrative, which had for decades hinged on Kerr's insistence that this had been a solo act, that he had not consulted or revealed his intentions to others, shifted to now be one of co-option, deception and duplicity. I'll skip over some fascinating letters between Sir Garfield Barwick and Kerr, which I also found in the archives, but which um, I don't have time to talk about now. But finally, Kerr's papers also provide the first glimpse of the knowledge and role of the palace in the dismissal, which I detail in the dismissal dossier here, the palace connection. Kerr details in his journal from 1980 a conversation with Prince Charles in September 1975. That's one month before supply was even blocked in the Senate. 
during which Kerr confided to Charles that he was considering dismissing the Whitlam government. In raising this with Charles, Kerr writes that his chief concern was, as ever, for his own position. He told Charles that he feared Whitlam might recall him, that is Kerr, if Whitlam became aware that Kerr was secretly considering dismissing him as Prime Minister. And you might, you might think, well, that possibly wouldn't have been an unreasonable response from Whitlam, <laughs> you know, if he'd discovered that his Governor-General was being deceptive, collusion, you know, collusive, and he already knew that he was basically a louche of a Governor-General, it might not have been unreasonable to ask for his recall, but which never actually happened. Kerr writes that Charles expressed dismay at the prospect, not of Whitlam's dismissal, but of Kerr's possible recall. <laughs> but surely, Sir John, the Queen should not have to ex accept advice that you should be recalled, should this happen when you are considering having to dismiss the government. And this, remember, is in September 1975. So clearly, at least according to Kerr's records, the palace knew that he was considering removing the government two months before, three months before it actually happened. Two months before it happened. Charles then relayed this extraordinary conversation to the Queen's private secretary, who then wrote to Kerr and reassured him, according to Kerr, that, quote, if the contingency to which you refer should arise, that is your recall, the palace would, quote, try to delay things. This is beyond scandalous, this conversation. That communication between Charles, the Queen's private secretary and the Governor General is politically and constitutionally shocking. It shows the palace in deep intrigue with Kerr, agreeing to protect his tenure as Governor General should Whitlam move to recall him, which was entirely his to do, in the months before the dismissal and all secret from the Prime Minister. This was a total rupture in the vice-regal relationship in a constitutional monarchy, at the heart of which is that the appointment and recall of a Governor-General is made by the Queen on the advice of the Australian Prime Minister alone. Those letters between the Palace and Kerr are part of the Palace letters, which I'm trying to gain access to through the archives. In conclusion, Trying to unpack this troubled, partisan, and flagrantly distorted history of the dismissal has been a fraught and sometimes unnerving exercise. In going down that fractured historical path, one is never far from the barbs of those remaining partisan figures, some of whom were there at the time, sundry monarchists and Kerr acolytes, some now with prominent media roles who should remain nameless, Gerard Henderson. <laughs> who, although diminishing in number, and despite the mounting evidence against them, remain committed not to history, but to its continued partisan distortion. Now, if these sound like harsh words, they are, and for good reason. <coughs> Take the letters which I didn't actually mention between, because I ran out of time, between Sir Garfield Barwick and John Kerr. They're written on the seventh anniversary of the dismissal, and they're sort of almost considering their handiwork. It's actually on the anniversary of the dismissal. But what they're talking about is recognising that there is a flawed and false history of the dismissal, precisely because Sir Anthony Mason's role is not yet known at that point. And yet they blithely determine that that false history can continue, that they will not reveal Mason's role. And they write, when the history should be known, it will only be after all of their deaths. Take also the several posthumous records from each of the key protagonists, which they left correcting the deceptive false history which they themselves had established. It's a common pattern we can see from Withers, from Fraser and from Kerr, each of whom left a record only to be released after their death and each of which was unprepared to face the public consequences of it, of their actions during their own lifetime. And take Sir Anthony Mason's absolutely startling retort to my plea when I inter interviewed him for the biography, by which time I had found Kerr's remarkable record, although I didn't tell him that, I asked him, would he speak to me about his role in the dismissal? And I, I asked him, would he acknowledge his role to the Australian public in the interests of history? Mason refused, saying, I owe history nothing. Distasteful, arrogant, cowardly, Call it what you will, but these are not the responses of honourable men who had spent a professional lifetime at the highest positions 
the public office with any discernible concern for the institutions of democracy or public accountability. Those questions of personal and political ethics, I think, are also at the heart of the dismissal. And I now find the secrecy, collusion and deception of a government and a Prime Minister in 1975 and of Australian history in the years since is as troubling now as the dismissal was itself more than 40 years ago. Now, because I want to end on a far more optimistic note, <laughs> let's return just very briefly for one minute to the lessons for reform from this extraordinary, almost operatic experience of the Whitlam government. And one of them must surely be that to achieve reform takes persistence, creativity, courage, and the capacity to remain positive in the face of often dire obstruction. Some years later, Gough Whitlam also recognised the lessons that his government and its experience would provide for future reformers. So long as future reformers, he said, didn't become focused on the obstruction and the difficulties faced by his government, he said there's a considerable cause for optimism, who's always an optimist, provided the new reformers are not preoccupied by what went wrong to the extent that they forget what went right and what we achieved. And this is one of the really remarkable human aspects of the dismissal, that it did not break Gough Whitlam's belief in parliamentary democracy and in his belief in the possibility of reform. Because ultimately, it wasn't the institutions that let him down, it was the people in them. Thank you. Do you think a dismissal could occur again in Australia? Well, unfortunately, yes. I mean, <coughs> All of the all of the preconditions could arise again um, in the future because you know although there's continuing legal and constitutional and certainly political argument over what Kerr did, and I personally, even though I'm not a lawyer, wouldn't hesitate to say I think what he did was improper beyond any doubt. Um, there's an argument about whether the reserve powers even had any currency given that most people at that point thought they had fallen into what's legally called desertude, which means simply withered away, you know, because they've never been used and that they couldn't be used because, and, and, and Sir Morris Byers, who was uh, Solicitor General at the time, later wrote that he'd come to the conclusion that reserve powers cannot exist for the simple reason that for them to exist, you have an appointed official, that is a Governor General, with no validity whatsoever electorally, being able to overturn an elected government. And he said that simply can't be tenable in a parliamentary democracy in our system of government. But nevertheless, that's the situation that in a way, the events of 1975 cemented because the precedent was set. Was set. And Whitlam didn't challenge it. From what I understand about Whitlam having done his biography, he would never have challenged it. He was not the sort of person to make, he, he, he was too protective of the institutions himself. Uh, which is why he never took Margaret's immediate comment that afternoon when he rang her to say, I've been dismissed. And her immediate reaction was, he can't dismiss you, you're the Governor General. Uh, sorry, you're the Prime Minister. You should have slapped his face and told him to get over it. <laughs> now, that was not Gough Whitlam, he was never going to do that. But, he, but to, you see, we, don't, we didn't understand until more recently that, of course, he thought he, he would be back in office that afternoon and he rang Margaret later and said, don't return to Canberra, she was in Sydney. Uh, he said, I'll be back in office this afternoon because se the Senate has passed supply, the House has moved a motion of no confidence in the Fraser government and called on the Governor-General to, to reinstate me. I'll be back in office, as he should have been. It was others who broke the conventions and the institutions, not Gough Whitlam. So yes, that's a long way of saying, unfortunately, it could happen again. Whether you would get a circumstance in which you had people, more than one person prepared to do that, I, I would hope not, but, but of course anything's possible. You have to have both a Governor General willing to remove an elected government in secret without discussing it with them, which was the un, uh, absolutely untenable part of it, really. And secondly, you had to have a leader of the opposition, Malcolm Fraser, who was prepared not only to take office in those circumstances, 
but to be the only Prime Minister in our history not to resign the moment he lost a motion of no confidence in the House of Representatives. Now, I know Fraser has remade himself subsequently, not in my book, because I know too much about what he did both before the dismissal, when he was Defence Minister, and he was absolute hawk over the Vietnam War, uh, and it doesn't wash with me the, re the revamp of Malcolm Fraser, I'm afraid. <laughs> You alluded to Whitlam's independent foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis French nuclear testing, um, and also his initiative in going to China, so obviously he wasn't thwarted by cozying up to communism. How, therefore, do you explain his attitude to East Timor, which was um, freeing itself from 400 years of Portuguese colonialism, and then another invasion by the Japanese in World War II? Um, the, I still have a vivid memory of Ali Alatas and Gareth Evans clinking champagne glasses over the divvying up of the Timor Sea resources. How do you explain that? How do I explain Gareth Evans or Gough Whitlam? No, Whitlam's co collaboration with Indonesia. Well, firstly, there was no collaboration with Indonesia. Um, it's one of the most misunderstood and erroneously presented aspects of the Whitlam government. Whitlam's view on East Timor, which was at that point Portuguese Timor, was that the colonising power, Portugal, ought to manage the post-colonial period properly. Portugal, as you might know, simply removed itself from what became East Timor in, I think, August 1975, only three months before Whitlam was facing his own upheaval. Whitlam's view always was to support East Timorese self-determination, always. He didn't support the Indonesian invasion. It's one of the most appalling calumnies that's been perpetrated against the Whitlam government. Indonesian invasion, do you know the date of the Indonesian invasion of East Timor? It was in 1975. It was, when the Fraser government was in office. It was in December. So, again, Malcolm Fraser has worked very hard at repositioning himself, despite the fact that he was head of the government that abstained from the UN vote the following year, calling on East Timor to remove it, for, for Indonesia to remove itself from East Timor. Whitlam's view always was that there should be a meaningful either referendum or plebiscite run by international bodies in East Timor to determine the wishes of the East Timorese people, always. If that was to allow incorporation into Indonesia, that was for us and everybody else to support. If they supported incorporation into some other, I can't remember what the other options were, they would support that as well. Um, if they supported Fretland, we, we should support that as well. It, 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 Whitlam's fundamental foreign policy stance was self-determination. He had just worked for three years to give PNG its own government to end its colonial relationship with Australia. And as he said at the time, were we meant to invade East Timor, were we meant to invade East Timor and take it over as a sort of neo-colonial power? So I think, you know, it's a complicated and very, very bitter dispute. But it is incorrect to say, in fact it's it's, 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 it's worse than incorrect to say that Whitlam in any way colluded with the Indonesians. He was, at that time period, and remember there are only, I think, two or three months in which he's also trying to, to become a part of a peacekeeping process in, in, in East Timor and to placate the Indonesians and ensure that they would not invade East Timor and that they would support instead a self-determination process for the East Timorese people. That was always the starting point for Whitlam over East Timor. And it's simply misunderstood. And the date of the invasion is often put as happening during the Whitlam government, when it was in December 1975. So those things are very important. And I know that this troubled the Americans, Whitlam's view on and position on East Timor, because one of the things I found, which is not in this book, but is in the updated volume, second volume of the Whitlam biography, uh, actually through WikiLeaks, was a, um, a meeting between Kissinger and others in the State Department indicating that they were bothered by Whitlam's position on East Timor and saying he had taken the high ground over ensuring self-determination for the East Timorese people. And when Fraser came to office, one of the first things he did was send a letter to Suharto 
saying that they fully understood the Indonesian position and never mentioning for a moment that key part of, the, of, 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 of Whitlam's policy, which was to support and ensure um, a plebiscite or some means of internationally recognised self-determination vote. So, um, sorry if I sound strong about it, but it, it, it is an often misunderstood part of his policy, and it's one I get asked frequently, and I, I, I you know, I feel, I, I don't quite understand where the misunderstanding has come from. It's, it's to do with the journalists, the five journalists yeah. who killed in October. That's right, that's right. Yeah. The Whitlam government didn't do anything about the journalists that were killed before that invasion. And they were still in office. I'm wondering what your response is to the place that Bob Hawke and the ACTU took in the days, I mean the days, immediately after the dismissal. Yeah. <clears throat> you mean the fact that they were calling for a, a strike or some mass action that wasn't taken? I, I, I was living in Melbourne at the time, and it seemed to me, as a very interested observer, that people in the streets would have been there in their thousands if they had been called out. But again, I, I haven't seen the, the record, especially not to compare with what you've seen, but it's just always interested me, did Bob Hall dampen things down? I think he could well have, yes. Um, and But I probably have a slightly different view on why that might have been the case. I think Whitlam might have wanted it dampened down as well. Um, and I, I have no evidence for that, but just from what I've looked at and what I've seen and what I understand of Gough Whitlam. I, I think he played a very difficult line after the dismissal. Initially, you see, you've got to remember that public opinion actually, aside from the sorts of areas you're looking at with unions and workers and younger people in particular and Labor supporters, where the, it was a totally polarised reaction. The one thing it did, the single thing the dismissal did, was turn around opinion polling. The opinion polling, and there wasn't a lot done at that time, it was a very laborious process, but there are about four really critical opinion polls while what we call the dismissal in a bigger sense from about October to, 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 to November were taking place. There'd been a 10-point turnaround in the opposition support against the opposition during that period in which supply was blocked. So the popular support was had turned towards the Whitlam government. Something like 75% of people disagreed with the blocking of supply, and that got higher and higher the longer it went on. And by the 4th of November, there was a really important opinion poll that not only showed the government clearly ahead on you know, what we now call two-party preferred in the House of Reps, but that it had every chance of actually winning the temporary numbers in the, in the Senate at the half-Senate election, actually winning a majority. It's often forgotten that the former Liberal Prime Minister, John Gordon, had resigned from the Liberal Party in disgust and was then going to run for the Senate at that half Senate election, he was going to pick up a lot of votes. The reason for pointing that out is that in the single act of, the, of dismissal totally turned those opinion polls around. And at the end of the following week, Fraser was light years ahead of Whitlam and the Labor government never had a chance of getting returned. So that's what Whitlam was grappling with. The longer he tried to argue and bring attention to the shocking fact of the dismissal, which everybody probably in this room was horrified by, the more the opinion polls went against him. So the strong advice from party headquarters was to stop pushing the dismissal. At every election rally, initially you see it in all of the, the, both the coverage and the speeches that he was giving at the time. Initially for the first week, they pushed that point of the, you know, the, 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 the unconstitutionality of, the, of what had happened, the fact that they should still be in office and so on. They stopped doing that after about a week and tried to turn back to traditional things like health, welfare and education. But that fact of a, of a, 
of, of most people actually feeling that with the removal of the government, the Governor General must have known something. There must have been more. This was a view that was pushed very strongly. And all of the newspapers came out in support of the dismissal, in support of the new Fraser government, and they had all the benefit of incumbency. So I put that decision, which was definitely a decision to call back on a desire for workers to take to the streets, coming from a view that that will only make things worse. Now, that's my considered opinion. I don't have any evidence for that. Um, but I share your concern about Bob Hawke. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt he was extremely conservative. Um, and that may well have been his decision as well. He's looking ahead already to a point where he's going to become leader of the Labor Party and become Prime Minister himself. And when he did become Prime Minister, there's not a lot of love between Gough Whitlam and Bob Hawke. Um, and, 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 and it was to Whitlam's lasting distress that it was Bob Hawke who reintroduced tertiary fees after Whitlam had removed them. Even Malcolm Fraser didn't dare remove them once he came into office, Bob Hawke did. So. Um, hi, Jenny. Um, there were a couple of things that enabled the blocking of supply, and it was the two senators that were replaced during that time. One was a Labor senator who died, and one was the appointment of Lionel Murphy to the High Court being replaced against convention. In your opinion, was that part of some greater conspiracy or was it just fortuitous for Sir John Kerr and enabling him to meet his end? Oh, I think it's definitely part of the conspiracy. That is a conspiracy I agree with. <laughs> because, you know, it's so bizarre to see Kerr speaking to people months before the dismissal and even when he was considering taking the position of Governor General the previous year. He'd only taken it up in mid-1974. Um, that he was so aware of the possible power of a Governor-General to remove a government. That was always something he was intrigued by and aware of. You know, there's a couple of interviews that I've found of him, of, sorry, of others who knew him well, like I think one was Justice Robert Hope, that stuck in my mind where he said that Kerr had come to see him to get his, to discuss with him, should I take up the position as, he was then the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. It was um, involvement of those, those premiers who appointed against convention to enable that situation. Absolutely, because they're conservative premiers. And, you know, one of Whitlam's greatest points of obstruction was through the conservative states. Um, every one of those bills that got through the joint sitting that I spoke of was challenged by one or other of the states. They all succeeded except for the Petroleum Minerals Authority Bill. But absolutely no doubt about that. It was a, it was a shocking breach of convention, for, uh, particularly given the election had been only 18 months, uh, in, in Murphy's case, only six months earlier. And when he moved to go to the High Court, instead of replacing Murphy, as we know is always done, by a member of the same party, the state <coughs> government of New South Wales, which was a Conservative government, refused to allow the Labor appointment to be appointed and instead chose their own appointment. And technically it's possible, but it's a total breach of the electorate, the will of the electorate as expressed at the previous Senate election, part of the double dissolution. And as you say, when Bert Milner died in Queensland, only a few months before the dismissal, that gave the necessary vote for the opposition in the Senate to um, not only block supply but to send it back to the House of Representatives with an amendment saying we call on the Whitlam government to go to a general election or we won't consider your supply bills. So yeah, it indicates again a very long period of planning and seizing opportunity. You could say that that's seeing some sort of form of political leadership. <laughs> on the Conservative side they see an opportunity and there was no opportunity and no unconventionality that they weren't prepared to take in order to get rid of the Whitlam government. And the more I've read and dissected this, the more convinced I am that the single reason why Kerr acted when he did and why the furore over the Whitlam government centred around that period of office is the simple reason of the half Senate election. Because the half Senate election, which as I say had to be called constitutionally at any time between June and June the following year, it appeared that because of a quirk of algebra, of a sort of a constitutional algebra to do with the new, the new, the territories getting the new senators, 
Four new senators had to take their place, two from each of the territories. At that point, it looked like the Whitlam government was the Labor Party was going to pick up three of those four. And there's a complicated constitutional arrangement which meant they would only have majority of the Senate then until the following July when the new senators would take their place. But those new ones would take their place immediately, as soon as the half Senate election was called. And so it's why people said the Whitlam government looked like it would have temporary control of the Senate. It's that that was sending shockwaves through the Conservative Party because they would no longer have the means to obstruct. And Alan Reid, the journalist I referred to earlier, called that, described it as forming a state of panic. That's the word he used. The Conservatives were in a state of panic over the half Senate election, convinced that Whitlam would use the majority in the Senate to destroy democracy as we know it. I mean, there are some quite hyster literally hysterical documents among the Liberal Party papers at around that time saying, this is the end of democracy as we know it. It will be the last genuinely democratic election. Whitlam's going to lock up the electoral system through his control of the Senate. And I'm more and more convinced that it was a simple <coughs> means of getting rid of the government before it had an opportunity to take what appeared to be a looming control of the Senate. The discrediting of Whitlam was about the Kemlani mm. deals. Mm. Yeah. That's what we were told at the time. The thing of East Timor, and yes, he was in charge, and the Balibo Five, and the invasion of East Timor came later. But at the time, the discrediting was, oh, he's done these awful deals yeah. with Kemlani. Yeah. More than just a hint of racism, we would now say. Yeah. You know, he was described in the, in the Herald as old rice and monkey nuts. I mean, it's appalling, because it was a Middle Eastern uh, trader who, who had access to um, what was then an OPEC field absolutely flush with funds. All around the world, Western, well, Western countries were taking advantage of those cheap funds in order to fund massive infrastructure projects, which was what, of course, the Whitlam government had. Um, it was to fund a, a, a really significant, and we would now say enormously important, and if only we had it, um, energy pipeline, a series of pipelines and a whole range of things to do with energy and mineral production, all under public ownership, which was to come from the northwest shelf in a series of pipelines and other infrastructure all the way down to provide gas and other things to the southeastern populated states. It was a huge project. It was Rex Connor's baby. It was his vision for energy self-sufficiency, which don't we wish we had it now instead of selling our gas overseas and having to buy it back at twice the price. But, you know, these are the things that have always been the difficulties that Australian governments have faced if they wanted to do anything about it, is managing the energy sector. And certainly the loans were in order to fund that. It was a 20-year loan. There never was a loan. What they signed as an executive council meeting, which Kerr, as Governor General, had to sign off on, and they actually signed two, two, uh, twice at different periods for different amounts, um, was to, en was to uh, enable Kemlani and others, it didn't specify Kemlani, it was to enable a search for funds to begin. And the demonisation of this process, particularly driven by Treasury and the arch-conservatives that remained from Menzies' times, was quite extraordinary. Treasury always said that they'd to been told nothing about it, that this was being done in secret, which is hard to understand, firstly, because it was an Executive Council meeting, which involved all of the four senior ministers and Sir John Kerr, and was, you know, had to be publicly gazetted. But secondly, because there are over 20 meetings, but which I found in the documents in the archives, Treasury attended. So when they say it was secret, they actually mean they disagreed. <coughs> There's nothing secret about it. But yes, that, that was used in the Herald in Melbourne, and I suppose it's the whole Herald Sun <coughs> uh, media group, was particularly strong in, in pushing this as a grotesque impropriety. And they even brought Kemlani out just the month before, paid for Kemlani to come to Australia, apparently with suitcases of documents, um, about two months before the dismissal, really just to get sort of election coverage, but to try and find something, anything, that would implicate Whitlam. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I think one of the things I would take from it for everyone, and I assume everyone's interested in reform and achieving reform, is that, you know, I get disheartened to see this frequent view that politics is broken and we can't do anything through Parliament. Every one of those reforms was achieved through parliamentary action. And it's important to remember that. Politics really matters, and every one of them affected people in their everyday lives. You know, I read really heartbreaking letters sent to Lionel Murphy, the Attorney General, another 
man subject to hideous calumnies in his life about whom I have written a biography, I recommend it. And, um, but really, really sad uh, letters from women who had been unable to leave, often a violent marriage, certainly an unhappy marriage, without also losing access to their children. Mm. Because at the time of, before no-fault divorce, you had fault divorce. And that meant there had to be fault in a marital breakdown. And that meant that if you left a marriage, you were the one at fault. Mm. And these letters were from women who had already done that and had already lost their access to children. And they all, said, it's too late for me, but no other woman should have to go through what I went through, and please continue with your efforts to get that bill through. It was really affected me, and showed how important letters are, and access to archives are. It yeah, it was, a, it was an extraordinary time. I mean, we were so ahead of... My honest thesis on feminism in 1968. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to know, can you clarify, particularly after Professor Nancy McLean talked with Hugh Remington at the festival, uh, recently about the people who are trying to destroy our democracies. Can you just clarify, was there any truth in the Falcon and the Snowman, the Telexes, uh, our man in Canberra, the CIA? Can you clarify anything around that topic? Because it's still very vague. It, it is, and it's vague because, um, I mean, basically this boils down to claims of CIA in involvement in a, in, a, in a real sense in a dismissal of the government. Um, it is vague because there isn't really any documentary evidence to support it. And it's not that I discount it at all after what I've seen. You know, I wouldn't discount anything. But, um, but I have been very conscious, I guess, as a historian that the history of the dismissal has been so wrong for so long. I really wanted to use take an opportunity to try and set the record as far as we had it and to use that sort of you know really fundamental research to see what's there and to write rewrite the history of the dismissal based on that material so that's what's in my dismissal dossier and as i said it's not to discount the aspect that you say and certainly without a doubt the cia was concerned about the whitlam government and the bases, and the bases. I don't believe that Whitlam wouldn't have continued the basis. In fact, I think there was every indication they were going to re-sign on the basis, but he didn't want it to continue for a 10-year period, which is what Fraser then put in place immediately after he came to office. You did say you'd bring the media in and show them that Yeah, I remember that. And certainly in the week, be weeks before the dismissal, in fact, just particularly coming to a head in the week before the dismissal, there was a huge outcry over security. Whitlam had, 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 had discovered that there was a CIA agent working, at least one, working at Pine Gap. And the, the convention was that the government is informed of where and who the CIA agents present in Australia are. They'd not, he'd not been informed and he was furious. And he threatened then, not just to name one, but to name all CIA, CIA agents that he was aware of in Australia in Parliament on the afternoon of the 11th of November. So there's for your conspiracy theory. <laughs> um, I did ask for the release from the archives recently of masses of cables from that time. I mean, it's not something I've sort of walked away from. I'm still sort of fossicking. But I need to find something that you might call a closer sort of connection than we've had so far. But, but what I would say is that I've got no doubt that, they, that, that, that Kerr was very concerned about those security um, upheavals in those weeks before. Certainly the Americans were. Kerr had security links, as we know. I think there are, there are several factors coming in putting pressure on Kerr, of which that's probably one. Interestingly, a couple of people said to me, oh, you should try and see the guest books at Government House and see who was visiting in the weeks before. <coughs> which I, of course, tried to do, can't be found. Oh. So, <laughs> I have a lot of stories about archival material that can't be found, including Gough Whitlam's apparently burnt uh, security file, which was burnt, what a surprise, after being kept for 60 years, it was burnt just weeks before I asked for it. So, you know, I, I've, I try not to be conspiratorial, but there are some very odd things in, in the search for records. So, uh, uh, I also think that the material I've uncovered about the palace interest, and I mean the palace very broadly, the British interest, I should say, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office role, which I detail here, pretty staggering. So there's a lot of pressures on Kerr.
um, and all around the House end election ultimately. He's a very weak man, a very troubled man. It was quite unpleasant spending so much time in his archives. <laughs> <laughs> so just one uh, last question, please. Yeah, I, I've been handed the mic to ask this question. There is a document of great significance, I think. It, it was sent by the Australian security officer in Washington on November the 10th or 8th, I believe, uh, describing an ultimatum he'd got from Theodore Shackley, who was the, I think, deputy, one of the deputy directors of the CIA at the time. And Shackley made it very clear that unless the Australian intelligence forces, the Australian government, the Australian Defence Department, or any, you know, all the uh, administrative elements of the Australian security system could guarantee that the Prime Minister would cease mentioning CIA secrets and stop uh, or uh, not name any CIA agents. Unless that could be guaranteed, the CIA and other American intelligence agencies would excommunicate the Australian intelligence community from the, what they call the Five Eyes, the Western uh, uh, security <coughs> empire, really, and that the, furthermore that that cable, the complete text of which has been made public years ago, is still easily available on my website for one place, but that there was also a, uh, a uh, clear uh, trail of panic over the revelations about Pine Gap, mm -hmm. that the renewal of the Pine Gap leases, and uh, I think uh, there's no question this was helpful in pushing Kerr over the edge, and I think it doesn't do us any service to, to describe that as conspiratorial or to say that those documents don't exist, they do. I agree totally, um, and that document you're referring to that went to, I think it went to ASIO just a few days before, yeah, that was revealed at the time because the person it went to was unfortunately for the CIA usually the second in command, as you would know. Yeah. And he was horrified yeah. at the fact that it said, whatever the security talk is for your eyes only, don't show it to the Prime Minister, and promptly took it to golf with them yes. and said, you should see this. So that, that, was, that, was, that was there. And I agree with you totally. The, 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 uh, and I'm not suggesting that's conspiratorial to suggest it. What I'm saying is that to go any further than what those documents, and they are in my biography, what, what, than, what they, than what we already know about that has not yet been, been shown. And particularly, you know, the Falcon and the Snowman references with our man in, in Canada. Well, there, are, there are clear documents about what uh, Boyce... Yeah, but in terms of what it means. What does our man in Canada oh, well, mean? That's, you know, yeah, that's, that's getting beyond yeah, the documents. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's nothing directly to link, as there isn't yet with the palace letters either. There's nothing no. to say, you know, dear John, sack off. Yours, Liz. You know, um, but I think the closest we come to this is this discussion that they have, indicating they're aware he's considering dismissing Whitlam. They've agreed to protect his position. I mean, how much more of a royal green light for what mm -hmm. he's considering do you need from that? But I do think it's all of those things, including that American pressure, undoubted security pressure. Yeah, I don't think there are any more documents that we're likely to find in the CIA files. But in a way. You don't need more. If they no. threaten to excommunicate yeah, the it's very security yeah. organisations, that's enough to push somebody over the edge. Yeah, especially Dialogue someone with a security background yeah. as Kurt had. Yeah. And he met with uh, Farron's, the chief scientist in the Australian uh, side of Pine Gap, yeah. uh, on November the 8th or the 9th. Mm -hmm. And that was denied at the time, of course. But then in uh, Tang's biography, he, mm -hmm. he said, yeah, that meeting took place. He, of course, didn't say what they said. And I think Farron sued Tui from memory, didn't he? I he did, but Tang confirmed yeah. the meeting for the yeah, press. That's the right. question was, what did he say at the meeting, etc. Yeah. But I totally applaud your work, by the way, Dennis. And yours. And your, 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 your determination to stay with it is, is great. And I think we all, you know.